This is the 32nd message in a series on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our message tonight is found in the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke 23, beginning in verse 26 and reading through the 32nd verse. We've been beholding the Lord Jesus. We saw him this morning in Pilate's judgment hall, scourged, released to the soldiers. The soldiers crowned him with thorns, clothed him with a purple robe, stuck a reed in his hand, mocked him, smote him, spit upon him, cursed him, finally drug him away to take him to Calvary. And at verse 26 we read, And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one, Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the womb that never bare, and the paths which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? I think oftentimes when we read the story of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, we may miss some tremendous truths found in what may appear at first to be trifles. Here are two incidents, both in themselves appearing to be trifles, but I think the keys to tremendous truths. His encounter with Simon of Cyrene and his short address to the women who bewailed him and lamented over him. First of all, let us review for a moment and realize that the Lord Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane's garden by the kiss of betrayal bestowed upon him by Judas, led away to the high priest's palace. He was hastily condemned on perjured testimony, shuttled over to the court of Pilate for a confirmation of the death sentence. There Pilate, in private interrogation, found no fault with the Lord and so told the people, refused to condemn him and sent him to the court of Herod. Herod examined him from a purely selfish point of view, desiring that he see a miracle, see some unusual thing at the hand of the Lord, and when the Lord answered him nothing, mocked him, sent him back to Pilate. Pilate interrogates him again, pleads with the people to release him, and when he sees that nothing will avail, washes his hands in a basin of water dramatically, announces that he will not bear any of the responsibility of the death of this innocent person, turns him over to the soldiers to be crucified. First he is scourged. Previously in the hall of Pilate he was beaten with the fist of those men, smitten in the face with an open hand. The prophet said his beard had been plucked by the handfuls from his face. And when the soldiers at last had their unspoken permission to do as they pleased with Jesus, they take him down to the fortress where a tenth of a legion are stationed, 600 men in all. And these soldiers began their horrible fun. First, they stripped him. He had been scourged from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. The lash had been heavy upon his back. It looked like a furred field. They clothed him in a dirty, cast-off officer's garment, made a crown of Galilean thorns or Judean thorns, pressed it upon his brow, put in his hand a reed for a scepter, mocked him, spit upon his face, worshipped him in awful hypocrisy and blasphemy took the purple robe from him, clothed him in his own seamless garment, laid his cross upon him, and led him forth to be crucified. 
In those days, a condemned criminal was not given any time for appeals or stay of execution. He was to be taken immediately and executed by the form of crucifixion. I understand it was a mile from Pilate's soldier's place to the place called Calvary. Jesus, still with superhuman strength under his own power and in his own enablement, still on his feet, bearing his own cross, led away through the gate of the city toward Calvary. It's significant to me, first of all, that he was crucified outside the city, for it had long been a custom of the Jews to refuse death to anyone inside that city, excepting those in the favor of God. And the nation had rejected him. And he was led outside, outside the gate. And the Apostle Paul, commenting on this in the book of Hebrews, speaks of his crucifixion outside the gate as the fulfillment of the Old Testament type, that the sin offering, whose blood was carried into the sanctuary by the high priest, that body was carried outside the gate to be burned on the dung pile, worthy to feel the fires of condemnation. And here comes the Lord Jesus on his way to Calvary to die outside the gate in the place of sinners. As it was the custom, a herald rode ahead of those who were condemned on his horse, announcing for all in the path the crime and the sentence that had been pronounced upon those who were about to die. So you can see by the herald going ahead how this large multitude would have gathered to watch these condemned men be crucified. For there were three, the two thieves, the transgressors with whom he was numbered, as the prophet said, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What a pitiful and sorrowful sight it must have been as they come through the gate of the city. They're outside the city now, between the gate of Jerusalem and the place of Calvary, when a strange thing happens. He apparently is not able to bear his cross any longer. I say apparently, for they would have had no reason to stop this procession, simply to change cross bear. It was a part of the law and a part of the condemnation that he bear his own cross. But apparently, not able to bear his own cross, the procession stops, and the soldiers, noticing one standing by the side of the road, Simon of Cyrene, a colored man, they came over, and the Greek says they impressed him. That is, they used military pressure. They commanded him to be the bearer of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think this is the first trifle in this trip between Jerusalem and the cross in which there are some great truths locked up. First of all, nothing happens by accident. Simon didn't just happen to be standing there. Jesus didn't just happen to stop there in the presence of Simon with his cross. I see the hand of a sovereign God in the event of Simon. First of all, let us look at the man. He was undoubtedly a Jewish proselyte. There were so many Jewish proselytes among the Cyrenians that they had their own synagogue in the city of Jerusalem, so we learn. It stands to reason, if since he was coming from the country, he was on his way from Libya and North Africa, which was his home, to Jerusalem for a special occasion. The special occasion, as everyone knows, was the Passover feast, celebrated every year by all Jews every place. They came to Jerusalem by the hundreds of thousands from all over the ancient world to celebrate the great feast of deliverance from their captivity in Egypt. It is reasonable to conclude that this Jewish proselyte, Simon, was on his way from Libya and North Africa into Jerusalem for the great feast of the Passover, which would be on the following day. As he comes along the road, he meets this pitiful little procession now growing to large numbers, for the herald has gathered the multitudes, and they have stopped along both sides of this road to watch the procession. Simon, apparently not too much concerned, but at least interested, stops to see what this is. And suddenly, he is accosted by soldiers. 
who say, you must bear the cross the rest of the way. I see him protest, refuse, but he is ordered at the risk of his life. And so reluctantly he comes, picks up the cross, and follows Jesus to Calvary. This man, you might be interested to know, was a descendant of Canaan, the son of Ham. He was under the curse of God for the uncovering of Noah's nakedness, and his ancestors were the Canaanites, the sworn enemies of God. And here is a man under the curse of God with a long history of being an enemy of God, suddenly whose path crosses with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he finds himself reluctantly irritated, frustrated, bitter, but carrying the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ to Calvary. Now, for something which may amaze you, I think we have scriptural evidence that this man, Simon, became a Christian. Doing a little research on this man, I find in the Gospel of Mark, when this account is given, that he is named as Simon, the father of Rufus and Alexander. Now, Mark wrote his gospel in the city of Rome. He wrote it for the Roman Christians. And he refers to Simon as the father of Rufus and Alexander as though Rufus and Alexander were well known to the saints in Rome. And so he could refer to their father in all confidence that they would understand of whom he spake. In the book of Romans, when Paul wrote to those same Roman Christians, in the 16th chapter, in the 13th verse, he said, Salute Rufus, elect or chosen of God and his mother and mine. Now we know that it wasn't Paul's real mother, but he referred to Rufus' mother or Simon's wife as a mother in the faith to him. With these two evidences coupled with a very strong evidence in Acts 13.1, where the church at Antioch is described, we find that in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers in those days. Two of these prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch are named as Simon the Niger and Lucius of Cyrene. The word Niger, and I'm sorry to tell you this, but since it's a fact, I know you won't think me uh, rude, the word Niger is the word from which we derive our little nickname, nigger, for Niger means black. And we have in Acts 13, 1, the record of the Holy Spirit that Simon, the black man from Cyrene, was a prophet or a teacher in the church at Antioch. What a gem of grace. What a gem of grace. I, this is a little sidetrack, reading that verse in Acts 13, 1 and lifting those teachers, I thought, what a gem of grace. What a roll call of grace. Three men out of those five, think of this, if you want to sing about amazing grace. Simon the black man from Cyrene, now a prophet, a teacher, an elder in the church at Antioch. Another man who had once been servant in the house of Herod saved right out of the household of Herod. Herod, who mocked the Lord Jesus Christ and who sent him to Pilate to be crucified, lives to see his own household servant saved by the grace of this vanquished Lord. And another gem of grace in those teachers, Saul, the rabbi who swore he would stamp the name of Jesus from the lips of every man, who breathed out slaughterings against the church, who consented to the death of Stephen, who was zealous to God in hating the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, now a teacher of this same Lord Jesus Christ. But back to Simon. First of all, I see in this experience with Simon the faithfulness of the Lord to give light to any man and to every man who wants it. I know Simon must have wanted truth, and he must have wanted light. In the days when travel was hard and life was hard, it's hard to conceive of a man being interested enough in religious observance to travel on foot from Libya in North Africa 
to the land of Palestine, across the Sinai Peninsula through the Gaza Desert, which was notorious for its bandits and its wild beasts, and on up the Gaza Road where Philip met the eunuch, and into the city of Jerusalem he came. And if you'll allow me to use my imagination for a moment, it seems to me that such a passion and such a desire to come to Jerusalem for the Passover must have been born in deep desire in his heart to know more about the truth of God. I don't know how any man could set through the Passover year after year and not wonder sometimes why it was that God wanted his people to remember every year about the lamb that died in Egypt. And I imagine in my mind that Simon must have asked himself many times and must have asked God that question recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, what meaneth this service? Why, O oh God, are we centuries later still to remember the Passover lamb? And perhaps he had often prayed down yonder in Libya that he might have knowledge and light of God's true lamb who would one day come into the world. And I marvel as I think of this experience about the faithfulness of God in not allowing a single soul who wants light to remain in darkness. And I believe Simon was led by the infallible and by the sovereign hand of God to that exact point at that exact time in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever think too lightly of trifles. It says he was coming in from the country speculating a little bit, it may be that he had intended to be there earlier, for he really was a little late. The beginning of the festival act activities had already passed. Here he was just a little late. It may be he had tried to be at Jerusalem the day before, but was detained. It may be that since he was coming in from the country, he had stopped at a nearby village and spent the night, and now on his way into Jerusalem, but nothing by chance. Had he hurried just a little or tarried just a while longer, he would have missed an eternal and divine appointment. He was where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there. And at that exact moment in time, his path crossed the path of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the sovereign grace of God, he was brought to know the Lord Jesus as his Savior. I look back in my own life at divine opportunity. Had it not been for that illness in 1947, I might well have yet been an infidel on my way to Christless eternity. But that exact moment and that exact experience which brought me to my knees in helplessness before God was the goodness and the faithfulness of a sovereign God who won't allow any man who wants light in his soul to go in darkness. That eunuch came to that exact spot in the Gaza desert where stood Philip ready to explain to him what Jesus was and what he had done. And here comes Simon. Oh, I can't help but let my imagination run wild a little bit with him. For somehow I feature him as coming out of the country, head bowed down, on his way to Jerusalem, meditating on the Passover, perhaps trying to prepare his heart spiritually for the things that lay ahead. And suddenly his thoughts are interrupted. His chain of thought is interrupted as he turns and sees this procession. Ah, three criminals about to be crucified. But what has that to do with me? And as he stands by the side of the road watching, soon he finds that he has been caught up in this eternal happening. And he was a part of it, against his will, to be sure. But at least here he is, with a heavy cross upon his back, which is not his, buried at the Calvary. I'm satisfied in my heart he's that Simon that became that prophet and teacher in the church at Antioch, whose sons were known among the saints at Rome, whose wife was a spiritual mother to the Apostle Paul, whose household was brought to know the saving grace of God in Christ because Simon was led by the faithful God to that point where Jesus collapsed under the weight of his cross. 
There are several observations that come to me concerning this. First of all, I've tried to let my imagination work on the conversation between himself and the Lord between that point in Calvary. To tell me there was no conversation stretches my imagination much further than to tell me that there was. If Jesus said nothing more than thank you, he had to converse with him. And I'm wondering if on that trip to Calvary, Jesus didn't explain the real meaning of that cross he bore on his back. Simon, that cross you bear, I will bear soon. It is yours now, but it will be mine in that place of death. And it was yours, Simon, long before you came along here. I knew you when you were yet in Libya. I knew you before you ever started out for Jerusalem. I knew you when you were in the loins of Canaan and in the breast of Ham. I've known you from an eternity past, Simon. See these stripes on my back? It wasn't the cross that made me collapse, Simon. No, not the cross that was laid on me. The iniquity that was laid on me. I'm bearing your sins, Simon, and I'm going to yonder tree to die as your substitute and as your Savior. You believe on me, Simon, and you'll never have a cross to carry. There'll never be any load of sin for you to mount and carry into the presence of God as I must do. I don't know what he said. Do you think he must have said something to him? And if he said something to Simon, what do you suppose he said? besides to give to him the real meaning of the cross he bore upon his back. And then I think of the grace, ah, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think for a moment that he was not physically able to bear that cross? You say, well, no, because he was beaten, yes. But in the wilderness of temptation, when he was sorely tried, when he was so weak from hunger, and from the constant attack of Satan, angels came and ministered to him and made him strong again. Do you not think that angels could have ministered to him there and given him the sufficient strength to carry that cross to Calvary? Do you not think in prophecy, Psalm 91, do you not think that God had not given his angels charge over him to bear him up in their hands lest he dash his foot against a stone? And do not think for a moment of those twelve legions of angels that he said he could call at any moment were not ready, willing, and able by an invisible means to lift the weight of that cross so that he could continue to carry it on to his place of death. Yes, I'm satisfied that he could have carried that cross all the way had he desired. But the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was that he allowed the weight of that cross to crush him, that Simon might have the privilege of carrying it. There are some lessons here for you Christians. Unless you see this motive in Christian work, you will never know the joy of fellowship with Jesus in the things he has given us to do. He didn't need Simon to carry his cross. He allowed him to. He didn't need him to lift that load. He gave him the privilege. He wasn't desperate for human help. He wasn't crying, please help me, please help me, lest I perish. He stopped and in royal grace gave a poor black man history's greatest privilege of carrying the cross upon which the Prince of Glory died. He doesn't need me to write books, and he doesn't need me to preach, and he doesn't need me to talk to the unsaved, and he doesn't need me to distribute literature. He doesn't need me to hold meetings. And he doesn't need me to do anything else. He has a hundred million angels and thousands, thousands more who can do his works. But he has given me the privilege, the joy, 
the opportunity of doing something for him. My, his life was a living testimony of grace. The last soul he saved was a thief and a murderer. <laughs> and the first living person who saw him after his resurrection was an ex-prostitute who had once been indwelt by seven demons. And the man chosen out of all the world for the priceless privilege of bearing the cross upon which the Prince of Glory died was a black man standing along the road of life, least candidate in all of that crowd for the honor bestowed upon him that day. And, like all of us, he had to be compelled to accept that holy privilege from the Lord. What grace. Oh, let it sink down into your hearts that he didn't need Simon to carry that cross, but he allowed him to. How good of the Lord to let Simon do that for him. Even though at the first he did not want to, I wager before he topped Calvary's hill, Simon saw what a priceless privilege had been his for he had been in the company of the Son of God, and he knew it. Never tell me, brethren, that you can go to Calvary with Jesus without being transformed. By the time he reached Calvary and saw that man die, he knew whose cross he had carried. If that centurion, blind and insensible as he was, that man who had charge of those soldiers who beat him and spit on him, if that man in the hardness of his heart could look into the face of Christ and say, Truly, this is the Son of God. What must Simon have said when he stood there after this trip to Calvary bearing his cross? Now, at the risk of you saying I'm contradicting myself, <laughs> I'll make another statement. Jesus needs us. <laughs> I just got through telling you he didn't need you for anything, but he does. He didn't need Simon to carry that cross, yet he did need him. How can I explain such a mystery as that? I can't, and I wouldn't try. But nevertheless, in some mysterious way, he needs us to help carry his burden in this life. He hinted at it in his teaching, for he spoke of men taking up a cross to follow him. For in some sense, the believer shares with him in his suffering in this present life. For if we love him, we indeed shall be hated as he was by the world. Marvel not, my brethren, he said, if the world hate you. And if we will to live godly in Christ Jesus, as the scripture says, we shall suffer persecution. He is the head and we are the body. And we are, in some mysterious sense, helping him to carry the offense and the burden of the cross in this present life, and what a holy privilege it is. And then one last observation concerning Simon. A trifling interruption, a trifling irritation in his life transformed. Simon got out of bed that morning. It was like any other morning. The world looked like it had looked always to Simon, and he put his shoes on the same way he had every morning before. And he started out with his own plans and with his own ideas as to what he would do and to where he would go. And along the road of life, a trifling irritation and interruption was transformed by the grace of God into the greatest day in Simon's life. Thought to give everybody a little courage to start out in the morning. If we could give our testimonies tonight collectively or individually, I'm sure that in every one of our personal testimonies there would be this element. A trifling interruption turned into an eternal and divine appointment. A minor irritation in our life turned into a major opportunity for God to transform us. If you think it was a glad day for Simon, <laughs> what do you think about Mrs. Simon, who became the spiritual mother of the Apostle Paul? 
What do you think about little Rufus and Alexander back in Libya who became elders in the church at Rome? What do you think about the church at Antioch, the saints of God, who one day would hear the personal testimony of this black man who had once been religious but lost? And I can hear him now in the assembly at Antioch. My brethren, once I was a poor sinner, lost and on my way to hell. I was religious, but alas and alack, I knew not Christ. Oh, I went to church. Why, I went all the way from North Africa to Palestine to church. Today people can't go across the street. Yes, I was religious, and I was zealous, and I did the best I could, but there was something lacking, for I didn't have peace with God, and I didn't know the joy of sins forgiven. I'd like to hurt his testimony, wouldn't you? One day, I don't know why I went. I know why I went. But one day I decided I'd go up to Jerusalem for the Passover. And I started. And I prayed and asked God to give me light from a soul. And just before I got to Jerusalem, I met a procession of people coming out of the city. And there in the center was this man. And you know, when he came right to the very point where I was standing, he collapsed. And I was compelled to bury his cross. Oh, I loathed that, and I hated that. Conviction isn't a very easy thing, you know. The burden of the cross of Christ suddenly laid upon a man as a heavy load. And that's what happens when the Holy Spirit convicts men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Because the guilt of the cross of Christ is laid upon his soul. And he's compelled to bear it what man in his right mind would take it willingly. And it was laid upon me. But as I carried that cross, I learned that I only had to carry it as far as Calvary. And there he would take it from me. And I would have peace with God. That's our story, isn't it? God the Holy Spirit lays upon us the guilt of the cross of Christ. But, oh, dear brethren, we only have to carry it as far as Calvary, for there he removes it as far as the east is from the west and casts it in the sea of his forgetfulness. I'd like to herd Simon, that black man. I'd like to herd him finish his testimony and saying, Brethren, what a glad day for me when the cross of Christ was laid on my back. What a glad day for my wife. What a glad day for Rufus and Alexander. And I imagine some of those things that Antioch must have said. And yes, Brother Simon, what a glad day for us. And then someone must have said, yes, but what a glad day it must have been for Jesus. For the good shepherd who seeks his own, when he finds him, calls his friends together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So much for Simon. One day we'll see him. We may not meet him again in this road of life, but we'll see him someday in the presence of Jesus. Black man now transformed by the power of God. <laughs> what a day. That was quite a day for Simon, wasn't it? About enough for one day. And then there's all kinds of encouraging things out of the story of Simon. For instance, the tiniest little insignificant thing done for Jesus might turn out to be of eternal consequence. That was a little significant thing. It was something nobody else wanted to do. But Simon did it all. He was compelled to do it, but he did it. And it turned out that he wrote his name in immortality upon the record of history. Nobody knows the name of that centurion, and not a name of those soldiers remains for history. But the name of Simon of Cyrene will be recorded as long as there is a Lamb's Book of Life. Now let us turn our attention in the closing moments of this message to another trifling incident along the path to Calvary. The women. And oh, God bless the women, because I have some good things to say about the women tonight for Jane. There were following him a great comedy of people and of women which also bewailed and lamented him, and the participle which connects women with bewailed and lamented 
defines the women alone as those who bewailed and lamented. Not all the people, just the women. You get the point? Now, I have something to say about women. I made an amazing discovery about women. I don't know what this means, but I'm going to pass it on to you. I've only not made just one discovery about women. I made a discovery 23 years ago about women. I've been learning about it ever since. There is no record, I want you to hear this, there is no record in the New Testament that is in the Gospels. The Lord Jesus lived 33 years in this life and there is not a single record of any woman ever becoming his enemy. No woman ever betrayed him. No woman ever denied him. No woman ever opposed him. No woman ever failed him. The pages are filled with the failure of men. But there is not a single incident where a woman turned against the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not content just to learn these little things. I like to think about them. And I like to ask why. And I begin to think and run through my mind on the subject of women in the New Testament, and I come up with some amazing things. They followed him. In Luke, one of the most touching statements, when we first started our walk of faith, the Lord gave me that verse of Scripture because it touched my heart. It says that the women, there were some women, who ministered to him out of their earthly possessions, and the Greek brings out that they took their little bit of money, what they had, and gave it to Jesus so he could continue with his ministry. You want to know how he was able to carry on in his ministry? Some women supported him. Women wept over him, anointed his feet with tears. It was a woman who brought the alabaster box in and broke it upon his head at Simon the Pharisee's house. Simon gave him no kiss, not even for his cheek. She kissed his feet. Simon didn't even wash his feet with water. She anointed his head and his feet with precious ice. And he gave as the only explanation for this woman's outburst of emotion the fact that she had been forgiven much and hence she loved much. Now I'm going to comment on this and you have to accept it in the spirit. You have to think upon this in the spirit. Because I know how wicked, desperately wicked and deceitful human heart is. And if you're not careful, your old wicked, deceitful heart will say to you, well, women have always been preacher followers. <laughs> women have always liked the preachers. Women have always been drawn to men who are leaders. Not so in this case. There was no beauty about him that any man should desire. I understand that to mean that there was nothing about him physically and there was nothing about him as a man that would have attracted anyone, let alone a woman. They were not drawn to him for any reason that was physical, nor any reason that was psychological. I think they were drawn to him because of a spiritual reason that only God himself could explain to your satisfaction tonight. But somehow, there has to be in woman a spiritual intuition that recognizes the Lord Jesus Christ as her deliverer from the curse which she brought upon the human race. And I don't know how to say it, Adam is always in the forefront in our thinking down through scripture by one man Paul says sin entered into the human race and death by sin but Adam was the federal head of the race Paul tells us that it was Eve who was deceived and it was she who brought the ruin of the race through Adam it was Eve who listened to Satan and who ate the fruit and it was to Eve that God gave his promise of a redeemer. She bare in her own body down through the years of time in the pains and sorrows of childbirth the spiritual remembrance that by her sin came and by her the redeemer would also come. 
And I can't do any more than mention it, but I believe that in womanhood there is some hidden intuition that makes them to know in a special sense the meaning of Christ's coming. How can we explain dear Anna, that prophetess who lived in the temple, who suddenly saw the Lord Jesus and went out to publish his name and talk about redemption in Israel? But more expressly, that woman at the well of Samaria who came into contact with him and with just a few words said, You are the Christ. She knew him, for he knew all that she had ever done, and she was drawn to him. All some men were drawn to him too, but I think it's significant that no women ever became his enemy in the four Gospels. Women followed him to the cross. The women of Galilee stood when all of the disciples had fled. And now, as far as I'm concerned, the only outward demonstration of sympathy and the only expression of kindness that has been shown to the Lord since he was arrested in Gethsemane's garden is shown by these women who begin to bewail and lament him. Now, wait a minute. How do we know they were sincere? Women are emotional, much more emotional than men. Some of them get hysterical at the sight of blood. Maybe they just got all worked up because they saw this bloody man being drugged along the streets and on the way to Calvary. I'll tell you the living demonstration of their sincerity. First, it was Jewish law that nobody was allowed to show any sympathy to a condemned man. And when they'd done this, they did it in express violation of the Jewish law and knew they would bring condemnation upon themselves for it. But that's the only part. Here is the living proof. Christ Jesus stopped acknowledged their bewailing and their lamenting and spoke to them. You say, what's so significant about that? Brother, Pilate spoke to him with all of the authority of Rome in his voice, and he answered him not a word. Herod spoke to him and demanded of him, and he stood silent in his presence. The soldiers mocked him and did everything in their power to break him into an outburst, and he answered them not a word. The scribes and the Pharisees, when he stood in the Sanhedrin, deviled him and tormented him, pestered him, trying to get an answer from him, and when he refused, took their hand and smote him in the mouth for his insolent silence. But in the physical condition that he was in, not even able to bear his own cross. And I'll show you on Wednesday night, it starts out that they led him away to be crucified, but Mark says when they arrived, they brought him or bore him to the place called Calvary. He wasn't mobile when he reached the hill. And this dying man, in the horrible condition that he was in, with the tumult of a multitude around crying for his blood, with the eternal destinies of thousands of souls hanging in the balance and heaven and hell focused on that eternal point in time. Over here is the sobbing of these women and stops to speak to them in response to the only show of mercy that has been offered to the Lord since he left Gethsemane's garden. And I say, I'm thankful for those women. They wept. Now in his answer, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. What a majestic statement. My God, shouldn't he have been wept for? Wouldn't it be enough to break any man's heart, let alone a woman, to look upon the suffering, dying Savior? What selflessness! Don't weep for me! Not a note of self-pity, not a note of bitterness, not a note of resentment. He could have said like I would have said or you would have said, yes, thank you, I certainly need your prayers and your weeping now. No, he said, don't weep for me. His thoughts were never for himself, but his thoughts were for them. 
why were his thoughts for them? These were not necessarily Christian women because they wept over him. These were the daughters of Jerusalem. And it was Jerusalem that said, His blood be on us and on our children. And he said, You better weep for yourself. Because if they have done this to a green tree, what will they do in the dry? Do you know what he was saying? He was saying, Oh, you better weep over yourselves. For if sin has taken such a toll of suffering in me, what do you think the wages of your sin will be when you are carried like dry trees to the judgment of God? There's something significant in this, and I want you to hear it. And again, like this morning, I don't want to press the point of the sword to your ribs. And I don't want to belittle anything that you may feel of sincerity in your heart for Jesus. But I want to tell you one thing point blank tonight. Shedding tears over the poor suffering Savior is no evidence of salvation. The tears that are evidence of salvation are the godly tears of godly sorrow over the fact that we have the guilt of his blood upon us, and we have sent him to Calvary's cross to die. They were feeling sorry for him, but they felt no concern over their own lost condition. His blood was upon them and upon their children, and he said their fate to come for the rejection of Christ was so great that it would be better that they had had no children that their breasts had never nursed their little babies, than to live to see the day when in the dry God would deal with them for the death of his son. Now I suppose if there's anything human about any of you, and if you have anything in the way of emotions, that the story of the cross could be told and stir within you some mercy and some pity for the suffering Savior. But if the Lord Jesus could stop tonight and give us one word in regards to these messages, brethren, where we've been looking at him, he would say this, don't weep for me. If you're unsaved, if the guilt of my blood is upon you, you better weep for yourself. For if they have done this to me, if the wrath of God has done this to me, what will it do to you in that day when it falls upon you? I've seen many crocodile tears shed over the poor suffering of Jesus. I'll tell you what pleases God, the broken and contrite spirit that sees in his own soul the condemnation and the guilt of the death of Christ and comes as a sweet-smelling savor and sacrifice offering to God by faith in Christ. Weep not for me daughters of Jerusalem. Oh, didn't he need to be wept over? No. No. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. His cup was bitter that hour. That mile was the longest mile he ever walked. He'd walked it many times in his mind, many times in his soul. That mile was before him in Gethsemane when his sweat stood out as drops of blood. That mile was before him, brethren, before he ever left heaven. In an eternity past, when he saw the cross, he saw that walk to Calvary. He wanted no tears. His suffering was soon to be over. He was six hours, six hours from death, and six hours from the end of all his earthly trials. But the future struck before those who had rejected him like an endless belt. And instead of filled with self-pity, his compassionate heart went out in one last warning to his rejectors. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, weep for yourselves. The day is coming. God will deal with you in his wrath. Cast you down 
Let me be sure. Not only was this true spiritually, brethren, it was true literally. Several years after the Lord died, in judgment upon the nation for their rejection of Christ, God allowed them to be overrun with their enemies and dispersed in every nation on earth. When God allowed the Roman army to siege Jerusalem, it was so horrible. The women and children died of starvation, screaming in the streets. The blood of the slain men of that city flowed over the curbstones and over the thresholds and into the hearthstones and put out the fires in Jewish homes. And every Sabbath evening, from that day until this, Godly Jews have gathered at the last remnant of Solomon's temple called the Wailing Wall, and they have wailed in their sorrow and lamented over fallen Israel. This Wailing Wall, brethren, that has been bathed in the tears of a, God, of a sorrowful nation, doesn't even know the beginning of sorrow compared to that eternal Wailing Wall where the lost will weep and gnash their teeth in an eternal and Christless hell, knowing that far better than weeping for Jesus, they should have wept for themselves when there was opportunity and there was time. Where is the man tonight, the woman, the boy or the girl, who is so seized with the sense of the guilt of Christ's death? He died for you that you're weeping not for him, but for yourself. Weeping for this great sin which you've committed against him. For this is the sin that consigns men's souls to an eternal hell, the sin of not believing on him who loved them and gave himself on them. Where are you tonight? You wept this morning, and perhaps you wept tonight for Jesus. Have you wept for yourself? Let us pray. Oh, Father, we ask you tonight that by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, if there should be those who have never seen that Jesus died for them, wounded for their transgressions and bruised for their iniquities, pray that tonight, dear Father, they will weep for themselves, not for the sorrow of their eternal destiny, but for the eternal grief which they have brought upon the Son of God. Oh, make them to believe in Jesus tonight as their Savior and their substitute. Like Simon of Cyrene, they were not brought here by chance tonight, but by the faithful and sovereign hand that longs to cross their path with his. They may have come here tonight, poor lost souls from North Africa, but they can go away redeemed by the grace of God. Help them to do what Paul told that jailer to do when he asked what he should do to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Thank you for this word, and Father, how can we ever thank thee for enabling us to see the face of Jesus today? For we have indeed seen him, loved him, and our lives shall never be the same again. Our hearts have been humbled by his love, and we trust that eternal good has been working us through his word. We commit it all to thee, In Jesus' precious name, amen. Lord bless you.